transform or change international policy to include these people? I mean, obviously, it's going to be very expensive. And mm -hmm. everybody's just, you know, all the G8 countries are kind of right. going like that right now. But, how, you know, what would you, what's this, is there a solution to this? I mean, to this one specific aspect. Right. The question we're facing is not how much it will cost to fix these problems that we're facing. The question is how much it will cost if we don't fix them. As environmentalists, we've been talking for decades about saving the planet. What we're talking about now is saving civilization itself. The stakes could not be higher. In Plan B 3.0, we identify four uh, key sort of points of action. One is to stabilize population. Another is to eradicate poverty. Um, we have the resources today to eradicate poverty in the world for the first time in human history if we decide to do so. And it would not be a, a, a big thing. And by eradicating poverty, we basically mean making sure that youngsters everywhere get at least a, an elementary school education, that they have rudimentary health care, um, that women have access to family planning services and so forth. It turns out that stabilizing population and um, eradicating poverty really go very, very closely together. We can't stabilize population if we don't eradicate poverty, and we're not going to eradicate poverty if we don't get the brakes on population growth. So we really have to go after those together. Um, then we, we, we need to look at restoring um, the Earth's natural support systems. And basically, these are agricultural support systems, soils and aquifers and forests and grasslands and so forth, and at the international level, uh, oceanic fisheries. And then the, the big challenge among these, and the fourth one, is to cut carbon emissions dramatically over the next decade or so. And in Plan B 3.0, in looking at the relationship between climate change and energy um, uh, consumption, energy policy, um, we didn't ask the question that politicians usually ask, which is how, uh, how, how much can we cut carbon emissions or, or what it, what is politically feasible in terms of cutting carbon emissions? And if you ask that question, then you conclude that we need to cut carbon emissions 80% by 2050. That's a rather convenient uh, date because very few people in political office today will be in office in 2050. But we didn't ask that question. We asked the question, what if we want to save the Greenland ice sheet? What if we want to save at least the, the larger glaciers in the Himalayas and on the Tibetan Plateau whose ice melt sustains the major river systems of Asia? How much and how fast do we have to cut carbon emissions if we want to do that, if we want to avoid the enormous rise in sea level um, that would create hundreds of millions of rising sea refugees. Um, and there, we conclude that we've gotta, we've gotta cut carbon emissions 80% by 2020. Now, I mean, it all sounds almost impossible, but it's not, it's entirely doable. Um, I mean, just to, for example, uh, it includes raising, systematically raising energy efficiency throughout the world. It means um, uh, a massive development of the Earth's renewable energy resources. It means banning deforestation and planting trees, billions and billions of trees to pull carbon out of the atmosphere. One example on efficiency. If we were worldwide to decide that we're going to take the climate threat seriously, and we're going to, over the next few years, shift entirely to the most efficient lighting technologies now available, which for most of the world would be compact fluorescent light bulbs in place of the old-fashioned incandescent uh, light bulbs. If we did that, <coughs> we could reduce world electricity use by 12%. That would enable us to close 
705 of the nearly 2,400 coal-fired power plants in the world today. Um, that's just one technology, and it's one that happens to be very profitable. You won't lose money by converting from incandescence to compact fluorescence because the compact fluorescence use only one, use only one fourth as much electricity. We then look at the development of renewable energy resources. And there's some exciting things happening now in this field. I mean, huge things. We used to think in developing renewable energy resources in very incremental terms, a little bit here and a little bit there. We're now seeing some quantum jumps uh, taking place. Um, we, today, we get 40% of our electricity worldwide from coal-fired power plants. The rest is hydro and gas-fired and oil-fired and, and, and some uh, renewables. But by 2020, we see 40% of the world's electricity coming from wind farms, a large amount from solar thermal power plants, from solar cells, and from geothermal energy. To get 40% of the world's electricity from wind, we would need to build and install 1.5 million wind turbines between now and 2020. Sounds like a lot. We already have over 100,000 wind turbines in operation, so it would be a 15-fold increase. Um, a million and a half wind turbines is not a lot in terms of manufacturing capacity. We produce 65 million cars every year. We're talking about one and a half million wind turbines over the next dozen years. We could produce those wind turbines on, in idled automobile assembly plants in the United States alone for the entire world. Entirely doable if we decide we want to do it. Now, the exciting thing is we're beginning to see uh, examples of some big time thinking in the U.S., the state of Texas, which for the last century has been our leading producer of oil, is now our leading generator of electricity from wind. This began, uh, Texas emerged as the leader a couple of years ago after it surpassed California. But in Texas today, there are some 45,000 megawatts of wind generating capacity, about 5,000 megawatts already in operation, and another 40 uh, either under construction or in various stages of development. 45,000 megawatts of wind generating capacity in Texas would supply the residential needs of the state's 24 million people. I mean, this is happening now, and they'll have this capacity built within a matter of years, not decades. Um, or there's a 5,000 megawatt wind farm now planned for the um, eastern part of South Dakota. And that wind farm is intended to feed electricity into across Iowa, into Illinois, and into the Midwestern grid. Um, another one just announced a 2,000 megawatt wind farm um, in uh, uh, southern south central Wyoming with a transmission line that will feed that into California. Um, I could go through many other examples. I was in Turkey um, launching the Turkish edition of Plan B 3.0 and met with the energy minister. Last year, the government of Turkey requested proposals for building wind farms in Turkey. They got proposals to, to build 78,000 megawatts of wind generating capacity. Turkey's current generating capacity total for the country all sources is 34,000 megawatts. Now, the energy minister pointed out, as is obvious, that there's a lot of overlap between these proposals. Um, some of them come from national firms, some come from international wind development uh, companies, but they will probably select about 15,000 megawatts out of this total to, to develop over the next few years. Um, I mean, that's big. Or I could talk about uh, Algeria with solar energy. Algeria has long been a producer and exporter of oil, but they know they're not going to be exporting oil forever. And so they're beginning to look at alternatives. And what they're doing is they're starting to develop 6,000 megawatts of solar thermal power plants. These are plants with mirrors that concentrate sunlight on a container with water in it that produces steam and generates electricity. 
There are going to be thousands of these plants built around the world over the next decade or two. But they plan to export this electricity via undersea cable to Europe. In fact, to Germany. They're, they're negotiating the terms of the contract uh, right now. Um, what this, what the Algerians point out, just to give a sense of the scale of the resource, is that in the desert, in their desert, they have, and the desert occupies most of the country, but in the Algerian desert, there's enough harnessable solar energy to power the world economy. Now, it almost sounds like a mistake, but I mean, another way of saying that is that the amount of sunlight striking the earth in one hour will power the world economy for one year. Um, or in the U.S., DOE back in 1991 pointed out that North Dakota, Kansas, and Texas have enough harnessable wind energy to satisfy national electricity needs. And, you know, when they came out with this, we all said, wow. But in retrospect, it was a gross underestimate because it was based on the wind turbine technologies in 1991. These are wind turbines about 120 feet tall, you know, like this. Now we're building 300-foot turbines with, you know, like this. So we're harnessing far more, um, uh, harvesting far more energy from wind and, in a, and because it's a higher elevation, much stronger. Um, those three states um, have enough wind energy to run, to not just satisfy national electricity needs, but to run the U.S. economy. Again, there are no real limits here. Another example, Indonesia. Indonesia, a couple hundred million people, um, has 500 volcanoes, 131 of which are active. They have an enormous amount of geothermal energy. They have announced plans to develop 6,800 megawatts of geothermal energy. I think Indonesia's total generating capacity is maybe 30,000 megawatts, all sources. So this would be a very substantial increase. And the interesting thing about it, Pertamina, which is the state oil company in Indonesia, where incidentally oil production has peaked and is declining, and Indonesia is now a net oil importer. So it's becoming clear to them they've got to begin looking at some other options. Pertamina, the state oil company, is responsible for developing 4,000 of these 6,800 megawatts of geothermal energy. It is the first oil company in the world that has made a major shift from developing oil resources to developing geothermal energy resources. Now, we've seen other oil companies like Shell and BP begin to develop solar cells and wind farms, but it's one or two or three percent of their total volume. For Pertamina, this is a big chunk of their total, total operating capacity being shifted from, from oil to geothermal energy. Wow. 